Mandy, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been really excited to talk to you about eco-psychology and particularly today, I was really hoping to focus our conversation around the areas of authenticity, which I know a lot of the writers in my audience and the creative professionals are really relating to, but also how that can be compromised by the habits that we have of attachment. So that might be a habit of seeking approval uh, and needing to connect to people and possibly sacrificing our authenticity. So we'll be diving into all of that because I know that certainly from your website, your content, your work, I know that believing yourself is really the foundation of a lot of the work that you do. You see it as, as the sort of center of being motivated, being passionate, dreaming. So I'd love to start there. And also perhaps if we can rewind the clock about 25 years to where I know you began your journey into wildness when you were uh, researching wild dogs and it started to teach you hang on a second perhaps perhaps I've lost my center perhaps perhaps uh, perhaps my own traumas are impacting my relationship so could you take us back to that moment when you really began to see how nature was giving you a really important message sure um, thanks very much for inviting me to be on this podcast Gabriella it's um, very inspiring for me to communicate and work with people who are really wanting to heal, to grow and to make a difference. Um, and I like the focus that you've, you've chosen. And I guess if I do go back 25 years, it was um, maybe even go back one step before that, is that your topic of connection and attachment, um, I think is very foundational to us. And often we are in situations as children even in growing up through life where things are disconnected. I think we live in a very kind of disconnected world in many ways and we tend to then disconnect with ourselves and core to reconnecting with ourselves is our authenticity. So uh, t over 25 years ago I had a very disconnected experience that connected me back to other disconnected experiences. I began to realize that when we experience trauma or these times of disconnection, they tend to repeat themselves unless you actually are aware of them and how they're impacting your life and start to resolve them. So at that time, um, I was going through a divorce. As a psychologist, social worker, it was uh, it was devastating for me to feel like I was what a divorce a now divorce statistic as I put it. Um, I was just you know I just thought this would never happen to me, and it was a big wake up call for me. And I realized that I really needed to look have a really good hard look at who I was, um, especially for the sake of my children because now they were going through. A split in the family and that was obviously significantly impacting them. So two things happened then. One was I began to do a lot of research on how to best support my children and the other thing that happened so that resulted in doing a master's degree around a Hurt to Hope divorce adjustment program for children um, which was impact implemented in South Africa and had a significant impact in the journey my life took as a psychologist. But as an eco-psychologist, the journey began because I remembered as a child that a very important healing place for me was in the bush. We lived in a little town called Kitwe in Zambia, and um, even before that, in a little place called Garneton, just outside of Kitwe along, the, um, along a river. And I used to often go and play down there with any friends who happened to be there, didn't matter what shape, color, size, we all played together. Um, and I remembered the bush being a very healing place for me. So I was drawn back into the bush. Um, I went back into the bush with a game guide friend of mine, and we went into Matuzadana and um, Mana Pools. 
and just spending days in the bush started to help me reconnect with myself and more specifically I began to gain insights from particular groups of animals so the first group were actually the wild dogs and I experienced things in my heart and my body first and then began to understand them in my head afterwards so what the wild dogs were drawing to making me aware of was that the the marriage disconnect was lit was a result of a disconnect at the age of 10 a very big disconnect when I was sent to boarding school my parents were moving from one care um, one country to another and I very much um, they wanted me they thought I was clever <laughs> and wanted me to still have good education so I went to they moved from Zambia to Zimbabwe and I went to school in South Africa but at the age of 10 I didn't see them for about six months and that was a very big separation um, and it was then that I learned to be very self-sufficient and pioneering but I also learned not to trust I learned to tr mm. feel that people wouldn't hang around for me and um, that people would leave me and I, I felt a sense of abandonment so what the wild dogs were showing me is that um, they were they only survived as a pack or as a group because they nurtured those kinship bonds and they were showing me that maybe that nurturing hadn't happened as it needed to have happened when I was very young um, in that particular situation not in every situation and um, they were just showing me that I needed to find groups where I felt a sense of belonging um, so that was the first thing and then I as I went through this journey I realized that every animal species I was drawn to had a particular thing to show me to heal in me to mature in me so that was where it all began Mm, thank you for sharing that, Mandy. For me, it's so interesting to hear an experience where you were seeing that message and you were able to, as you said, feel it in your heart and allow allow the understanding of it to, to drop in like it didn't it didn't come straight to your head and I think that is what happens in nature which I think is why it's so powerful because it it gets straight to the body which is so important because it's often when we're trapped in our head that we're trapped in that story or that incorrect version where there's so much more to access in the body so I'd love for you to explain a little bit more about that for someone who's listening saying you know what, what, what does she mean that it was in her heart and then and then she she made sense of it later like what's going on there um i guess i could say that personally and a little bit more sort of intellectually so on the more sort of intellectual level um so what was happening for me was I was experiencing this kind of being at ease, I was experiencing getting to know myself a little bit better. Um, but for example, I only heard about the wild dogs and how they connected and they only survived. Early man and the wild dogs have something in common. They only survived because they nurtured those kinship bonds. So that came as intellectual information as I began spending time in the bush with um, researchers, with ecologists, with game guides. I just couldn't wait to get into the bush. It was just a, a resting place for me, a connecting place. I could feel myself. Um, mm. But on a more sort of intellectual level, having done this journey for 25 years now <laughs> or over that, I think nature is a place that's been tried and tested. So when you get into nature, it's very harmonizing, very holding. Um, it's very balanced. And as a result, you can just breathe and just relax and just really get to the more emotional side. So nature works more on the emotional side, more on the right brain side than the left brain side. You can kind of leave all the reasoning and rationalizing and you experience nature. You know, you're not sitting in a classroom um, listening to a lecture. Um, you're actually experiencing it in your body and in your heart and in your mind. 
and it, it grows you know as you spend more time in nature you kind of evolve um, well that's what happened for me <laughs> so as I um, moved from realizing I needed to be part of um, nurturing groups and not just sit on the outside and that I didn't know how to be part of a group unless I knew who I was I didn't know what I liked, mm. what I didn't like. So how do I know what group I wanted to be in? And if I didn't know who I was, how could I meaningfully connect with other people? So the journey was very much about learning who I was. Um, and that mm. moved me into spending a lot of time with elephants. You know, at that time I was um, doing this program, this divorce adjustment program for children. and. I had reached a ceiling with the wild dogs. Um, it kind of happens in nature if you really get into conservation. There are a lot of different stakeholders and I was receiving a lot of acknowledgement and even financial offers to promote what I was doing, which really kind of, because I hadn't done a biology degree, upset some of the, the head ecologists and things like that. They were a bit worried about what I was going to do, even though I was very much including them in the process. It was just a bit threatening for them because they didn't think on an emotional level. Um, so I had to move out of observing the wild dogs to a different animal species. But you know, when one door um, closes, another one opens. And in this journey, I've experienced such incredible synchronicity things that will happen way beyond what I could have orchestrated or put together. So the next thing that happened was the opening to observe um, elephants who'd had good family life and elephants whose mothers, sisters, brothers, all the old elephants had been culled in the late 1980s in a big Kruger cull. And some of these little orphans, as we call them, were moved into different reserves around um, South Africa. And very interestingly, I, through a synchronistic event, through a client, through, well, you know, there's too much to explain, but read my book. <laughs> it's all in there. Um, I, I ended up um, being at a reserve, Pongola Game Reserve in South Africa, where there was a group of elephants who'd been moved back into that area after a hundred of years of not being there because of wars and agriculturalization and all sorts of things. They'd been moved back in their two families from Kruger who'd had a normal family experience. And um, a couple of the bulls who were also in that group actually were left Pongola Game Reserve, walked what two of them left one went on a roundabout and got into a lot of trouble although he didn't do too much um, the villagers were a little bit threatened and he ended up getting shot which was very very sad um, the other bull called Ngani went to Milamani which is a reserve about 40 kilometers from Pongola Game Reserve met with this little orphan group who'd, who'd been four or five years old and were now adolescent and they were 15 months later, they actually walked the same route and Ghani had come to visit them. They walked the same route across the end to uh, a major motorway <laughs> and into Pongola and um, Ghani was there to meet them. And at that, so that had happened and I had the wonderful opportunity to look at the difference in the mothering behavior of those two families who'd be moved in there and the orphans who were becoming first-time mothers. And that was just really important for me. And, you know, it was just, as I say, one of these synchronistic things happened, giving me really valuable mm -hmm. insights as a, uh, a divorced parent, single parent, kind of coming back into a new marriage and a new family arrangement. <laughs> you know, there was, there was just so much insight that I was gaining from the elephants. And that was kind of how things progressed each, you know, after that came the dolphins, you know, um, the dolphins were about play and um, we're, I'm kind of diverting a little bit because you're asking what it is to be in the body. So now that we're at the dolphins, let me talk a little bit about that. You know, when you swim with the dolphins, it's the most incredible experience. It's, 
it's kind of beyond words to explain um, but they they connect with you on a very intimate level um, and it's in your body <laughs> you know it really is in your body because they use their sonar capabilities to almost scan your body and they have this incredible ability to pick up if something's wrong so a lot of dolphin research has shown um, people who are very depressed have swam with dolphins and come out and just felt this lightness like they could let go of the absolute darkness they'd been in um, People who had cancers have found that that sonar has broken down the cancer. You know, people with um, immune problems have found that their immune systems had been completely realigned. So it's a very in the body, <laughs> but at the same time, they're very spiritual. They're very inspirational. Um, and I had a, sorry if I'm talking too much, but I had an amazing um, a group who, of two pregnant women and their partners and a friend who came to do a Healing Power of Dolphin experience with me. And it was very profound because uh, through the experience, and I know the person would be happy for me to share this with her, with you, I've checked this out with her and it is in my book. Um, she uh, was really afraid of miscarrying and she had this incredible swim with the dolphins where two mothers and two calves actually swam on either side of her, reassuring her that the baby growing inside of her was doing okay. And then after the experience, they lived in Cape Town, they saw dolphins, they were sitting on the, on the beach at Camps Bay and they saw dolphins. So she was a really good swimmer and she was really almost ready to give birth. Um, her and her partner swam out to the dolphins. He came back, it's freezing in that water. He came back, she came back after him. And what had happened, they'd had a circle swim with the, some of the dolphins and then as he was coming back, they left. And then one dolphin came back to swim with her. And when she got out of the water, she was absolutely in tears. He said, what's going on? You had so, that was such an amazing experience. She said, that dolphin told me the baby's at risk. And they rushed to Somerset Hospital. The doctor said, yes, you've got a blood clot. If, we ha if you hadn't got her now, you would have lost this baby. And she, she, she didn't. She gave birth to the baby. And we, we called the two little boys that were born out of that experience, the dolphin boys, because even though they don't live near each other, <clears throat> when they get together, it's like they know each other. It's just an amazing connection. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to explain how deep it goes, this, this connection with nature. <laughs> Sorry, I always get tearful. That story really, that oh. experience really um, impacts me. <laughs> yeah, Mandy, I, me too. I'm really welling up and choking up. For me, as I'm listening to you sharing each of these stories with the dolphins, the elephants, a sense of the wild dogs, and that lovely phrase that you said, you know, how could I become part of a group if I didn't know myself? What's dropping in for me? And I get this from my own experience of being in nature, is when I'm in nature, I feel so known. You know, I'm thinking of the dolphins, you know, being able to sense you. I'm thinking of the way animals approach in a certain way and they know you and I think if we go back to that theme of authenticity and detachment if we've grown up having to sacrifice our truth or our needs for somebody else in order to remain connected we lose that knowing of ourselves but when we go back in nature being known by nature in the way that we may not have been known by our caretakers is incredibly healing it is so whew, okay <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go a little deeper with this mandy because i really i just feel that, that the sense of something here so I know that you've obviously you've written you've written your book Awakening the Wild Within which is coming out this year so you've got an understanding of the writing process. Let's imagine that we have a, a portion of writers who 
had various experiences when they were growing up that they had to sacrifice some inner truth or some inner need because of what their caretakers or their teachers were asking of them so they they learned to prioritize that attachment i'm going to i'm going to do something so that you approve even if it, it feels like it's going against my soul what can you what can you explain to us about how nature can help sort of switch that balance so that we can begin to prioritize and know ourselves and, and let those patterns go? My experience has been a combination of nature and sometimes, um, you know, being a psychologist, being in my own therapy process. So it's been a little bit of a combination for me. Um, I, I think I've really liked that combination. So I think I really like being a psychologist and an eco-psychologist. Um, I think what you find, and I think what Edward Wilson said as a well-known biologist, um, he's sadly no longer alive, but very passionate about nature, is that we have a primal or an old brain that's located in our limbic system. And it comes from the reptilian brain. Um, and it's in that area that we carry um, the memories of caretakers, good and bad memories. It's in that area that we have our survival and our bonding capabilities. It's in that area that we have what, what they call the amygdala, which is the one is the part of our brain that responds to stress with fight, flight, freeze or fawn. Um, the different ways where we, um, and it's that survival brain that's definitely, and this is where I'm going more into the psychology area, um, but it, it's a valuable area to provide understanding. Um, it's, it's that part of the brain that we often uh, engage with, usually in trauma, in when we're young, um, and it's, it's that part of the brain that helps us to survive. So if I give an example, I did a weekly wilderness webinar last night on people pleasers, you know, and if we have that kind of orientation, like, you, like you've been saying, we compromise who we are, always trying to please other people. And that often comes from an early experience of not really being recognized for who we are, um, of always having to please other people just to get to survive or just to get recognized or just mm -hmm. to get some sense of value. So in that early experience, it might be the only way we can survive. When that continues on into our adult lives, it sometimes trips us up. It might be good in terms of connecting with people, being friendly, but we don't know ourselves because we're so focused on the other person and we get so exhausted trying to meet everybody else's needs that we compromise our own health, our own knowing who we are, our own authenticity. So when we get back into the bush, a lot of um, primal, a lot of the animals operate. I have this word that I've, I've coined for myself. Um, they operate in their God creative, instinctive ways of behaving. You know, and we have God created ways of behaving too in my kind of belief system. Um, but we have a choice. They don't have a choice. Many of them, you know, animals with more um, higher evolved brains like, you know, the primates, like the, the elephants, like the dolphins, they can have transcendent thinking. They don't just operate intuitively. But many of the animals, birds, insects, you'll be spending time with they get it, get to you at that survival brain level. <laughs> so they bring down your cortisol levels, they help you relax. Um, and just by, you know, there are so many ex ex um, examples I could give you, but because I, when, when, I go, when I take people on a wilderness experience, the reason it works is because you know, I facilitate it, sure, but there's so many other factors that come into the, into the mix. So one of the major factors is that people who are in a group that I might be facilitating 
will notice different things in a wildlife encounter. So if, say, for example, we come across the elephants and you see a, a, a group of um, mother elephants lager around the little ones for protection. And you might see some bull elephants sparring off, testing their strength in on the side. Um, the people there, will, whatever's going on in their own internal landscape, will reflect on the external landscape as to what's good. It's like a mirror. So I suppose nature of, often mm -hmm. operates like a mirror. Um, and it's what nature reveals to you. So the people who are dealing with conflict in the office might be noticing the sparring bulls. The people who've maybe had a sense of abandonment in their lives will notice how the mothers lager around the little ones. So I think that's the way nature operates. It's like a mirror. It's like a, yeah. And if you, you know, you can go into nature. What I find is a lot of people go into nature and it's very healing. But to have the facilitation of being able to process what it is you experience is also helpful because when things just stay in that lower portion of your brain and they don't move up into the hippocampus, which is like the, uh, the library of your brain, um, and then your neocortex is almost like the CEO. So if the CEO can't access the library, to rewrite the stories. Um, so it's very important to move it up from the experience, the bodily experience, mm. to the process of what, what it is you're experiencing. There's also that step that's very important. So I guess that's why I like both the psychology and the eco-psychology mm. aspect that come together quite well for me. Yes, I love the, conversa uh, the conversation, the combination of it to Mandy I think it it's it's that word facilitation because yes it's it's incredible to be in nature but to have some lens of understanding or some or some sort of mindful awareness what what comes to me and there's there's a couple of things I want to pick up on on what you've said so let's first of all I want to come back to the mirroring but let's first of all go a little further back because what I've heard a few times is you describe that sense of ease and calm that can come when we're in nature. And when we're in that place of ease and calm, it makes that knowing ourselves or that reconnection to our authenticity easier. And, and what's coming to me, because you talked about that, that limp, the, the, the reptile brain, that, that stress state, so if we come from our childhood, these very stressful experiences where we had to please somebody, we had to sort of deny who we were, we can imagine that all of those learning experiences, we would have been in a state of stress. And so when we're in that state of stress, there's going to be a real fear of being our true selves, of revealing our desires. And so unless we're able to calm down the body and that's certainly been my own experience we can't even begin to come into that soft place where we sort of let you know we let the truth of ourselves out so that's that's the first piece I'm really sensing is nature kind of gives us that soft holding so that we can begin to let our true selves out I think it's not just the soft holding I think it's the affirmation the affirmation that we're okay for whoever we are just because we exist. You know, I think it's a, it's a wonderful, you, you, as soon as you get into nature, you are accepted for whoever you are. There's no discrimination there. There's no, only if you this education or only if you do this for me or, you know, it's just, you, you're accepted. <laughs> it's, it's a given, you know, and I think that's definitely, and I think, what happens is when you reconnect with yourself in nature um, that's the primary place of starting because if we stick with the people pleasing example um, when you reconnect with yourself you, that's when you begin to find your own passion and often with people you know just as an example with the people with somebody who's people pleasing um, they're afraid of conflict, 
They're afraid of really saying their truth. They're afraid of their authenticity because it might lead to a disconnect because your whole life you've been doing stuff for other people to stay connected. So you really fear being disconnected. But immediately you start to connect with yourself. You don't, it's not so important, the connection with others. I'm not saying you don't need other people, but the primary thing is not to abandon yourself because from that core place, you can begin to start to connect in a different way. So if you really, as a, somebody who's a people pleaser, really connect with yourself, you're not afraid of, you know, and you gain your passion, you gain your courage, you don't care what other people say, you know what you want to do, you know what excites you, you know what your dreams and desires, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. You can face conflict, you can set boundaries, you can have the courage, you know, so starting at that essential core place just impacts every other kind of way of connecting. I love that. And also, as I'm listening to you and you're talking about that, that place of it, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter about those connections or what people think, because you've got that inner connection. The feel of that is very different from the wounded place where we can be, where we're sort of like, you know, screw you, screw you. I don't need anybody. You know, that's still when we're very much activated. But when we've come into that calm place, because as you say, and thank you for adding that, we get that affirmation from nature it's a very different experience so here's my question mandy because you talked about the mirroring so let's say um let's say i'm a writer i've been getting a, a huge amount of rejection i've been submitting my work i've been sending my books out rejection 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 so there's a chance then that i'll go into nature and i might see the the, the, the elephant calf and I might see the mothers and I might I might zone in to some demonstration of rejection. So on the one hand, we've got this ability for nature to just absolutely affirm us to say you don't need to be anything other than who you are and you're completely accepted. But what happens if I'm coming into nature with such a negative lens that I'm painting? It's almost like I'm I'm, I'm not able to see or sense that affirmation because what I'm seeing is everything through that lens of rejection. How do we start to understand this isn't, this isn't the truth, this is just that lens or that mirror, and how, how can we work at that level? I think for me, you know, even if you go into nature in a negative way, um, because it is such a positive place, <laughs> such a balanced place, it cannot just it cannot help but just be healing. Um, it will kind of start to shift your brain, but I do think and how you perceiving things. Um, I feel like I'm want I'm I'm I feel like I'm wanting to say quite a few things here, so. I'm wanting to go back to a couple of examples, a couple of a recent example maybe um, that might be I'm working with a client who has been in a high care situation, very suicidal and self-harming. She's now re regained, she, she's re now uh, settled down and she's been amazing in terms of her engagement in the psychology process. Not, not only with me, other, other psychologists in the places where she's been. Um, and she has really, she's an amazing person, she's just lovely. But recently at home, so she's now back home with her family, recently she um, opened something and it triggered back to when she was in the, that high security situation. And she went into a bit of a dissociative state, disconnected state and started kind of rocking and her little dog who was sleeping on her bed and she started he just com suddenly woke up started licking her all over her face and reassuring her so it's just an example of how nature responds you know she didn't need to say anything she didn't mm. scream out she didn't do, um, and it completely started to calm her down you know but it's what happens in nature. It calms you down. It reassures you. It, 
But I do think there's still a place, um, in my understanding, I might be wrong, for psychology as well. So, for example, mm. um, something that brings together a lot of the things we've been talking about. I've been doing, um, there's, a, there's a recent book written by Coach Shazard um, called Positive Intelligence, and he's created an operating system based on a lot of research from depth psychology, neuropsychology, cognitive behavioral psychology, um, that very much helps you understand what are your saboteurs, what are the things in your, in your survival brain that have evolved to help you survive that now are sabotaging your energy and your time, your authenticity, your connectedness, your impact on the world. Um, and he's operationalized the system onto a mobile app so that on a daily basis you can and he gets you to go through very sort of simple practical things like for example this is one of the things so if you just rub your two fingers together like that which seems really crazy but if you just start rubbing them together so that you can actually feel the ridges on your fingers you actually do start to relax. It starts to reduce the cortisol levels and then you know you do something like that. But there are a whole lot of kind of things that get you to de-stress and do, but on the same time, getting you to build the area of your brain that is more related to your essence, you know, or who you were before mm -hmm. you got damaged in some way, and also building into the sage part of your brain. So developing a different neural pathway. So for me, I would combine the two. I would get into nature. I would do some, some of this kind of thing, maybe engage with a coach, get to know yourself a little bit better because although nature gives us that amazing healing and comfort and restoration and invigoration, um, we, all, we relate to people and it is in our relationship with people that things went wrong in the first place. So it often helps to, you know, be in a, in a therapy situation with somebody relating to a person who can support you in a way or um, help you know how to meet the needs that were not met or the damage that mm. was done, helping you to re-engage with yourself in that kind of way. I think I think both have been really important for me. Mm. So rich, Manzi, the that that's lovely. Actually, I I can really Did see how it? how yeah. that yeah I can for me into that after that that, that body contact is yeah that body contact is so important and and it's also it's making me aware that for writers and creatives so much of our daily process is happening out of the body at the moment we're mm -hmm. we're very much focusing on well i'm writing it you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using my brain but one of the things that i've really learned over the years as i've deepened my connection in nature my shamanic practice as i've deepened my breathwork practice is actually an understanding that when i write from my body mm -hmm. it's a far richer experience and actually if I'm sort of relying on my intellect it's mm -hmm. it seems to be a very finite resource and mm -hmm. often if I'm up in my head that's where I find all those sabotaging thoughts and patterns mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts Mandy because I know that you've you've got your book which is coming out this year so you're aware of that writing process and you you know you write the the blogs on your website as well and and, and other things what do you notice either in your own experience or perhaps with clients that you work with how this is a bit of a theory I've got that the creative process can for some of us almost start as a bit of a trauma reenactment. You, you talked earlier about the repeating of trauma that you noticed 25 years ago. So what do you notice how the creative process can almost be a reenactment of our traumas and how we might begin to spot oh that's not just me or my personality or that's not just how the creative process is that's something playing out wanting to be seen and, and healed and integrated yeah and i think it all goes back to connecting with yourself <laughs> you know so um you know i was thinking back to 
the very beginning of that question. Um, I think when you write from from your body and not from your head, it's a good starting point. So, you know, if people feel stuck or they are processing things, I would encourage them to journal, you know, before you actually wake up or when you wake up in the morning before your rational brain kicks in, grab a cup of tea or coffee or hot lemon or whatever it is you drink and just journal, just write. You know, it doesn't matter what you write, just write, you know, and, and it kind of is in that less conscious state that you start to let go of things, you start to process things. Um, can you remind me of the rest of the question? Yeah, so thank you for sharing that, that, that idea that we can journal in that more liminal state. Oh, about so the form. second part of the question, I, I was really curious about your thoughts on how for some of us, the creative process can start as a bit of a trauma reenactment because it, the creative process to me is a place where we, we want to express, we want to release, we want to pour forth. But if we've got some trauma around the way that we expressed ourselves and how that re was received, we can sort of get into a trauma reenactment and think, oh, well, that's just the creative process or, well, that's just how it is versus, ah, oh, this is an opportunity for healing. Yeah, I think, I think there are a couple of things to say about that. I think the trauma is a gift, can be a gift. The trauma can be a gift in terms of gaining deeper, deeper um, empathy, I guess, or deeper understanding, mm. not only of yourself, but of other people going through a similar situation. Um, and I think, you know, with the positive intelligence that I was talking about, a lot of the, a lot of the concepts behind that are each situation that you're in treating it as a gift. But then I also wanted to say something about Integrity Media, who are publishing my book, because they've also developed an app, which I think is valuable for writers. And it's the person who's at the head of Integrity Media. He healed himself by writing. So he's created this mm. app where people can have that expression. They can, it can be cathartic for them to express what it is that of having gone through that trauma, how it's impacted their life, if they have any solutions that have come their way in the process to be able to express that as well, maybe through to, to, for nature writers to talk about how nature has been a powerful impact in the kind of trauma experience. But I think I also come back again to needing the combination of the two. So I'll give you an example. One of the people I had on a Wisdom of Elephants experience, actually two people I could give you an example of. So the one person, she had been, you know, she experienced incest in her early childhood experience. And when she saw the mothers, the elephant mothers, lagering around and protecting the little you know, she was she was disrupting everybody's life in, in, in as a group. They were staying in one place and she kept getting up at night and going to the toilet and getting up and shuffling around and nobody could sleep. So they were all pretty angry with her. Um, then it came out because she had this experience and she saw the nurturing of the mother elephants, it enabled her to express the trauma. So in um, mm. our um, discussion group after she had seen this she just burst into tears and she expressed and everybody then understood why she was getting up so often at night you know it was always at night that this um, sexual abuse would happen so I think being in nature can um, surface the trauma m make it make you more aware of it I could even go to um, a lot of research done by Olivia de Bergerac um, with dolphins. Um, what she's found from her research is that a lot of the um, trauma that we experience is laid down in 
our, a theta brain state and as children we're often in that theta brain state when you swim mm. with dolphins they bring you into that theta brain state um, but then they also take you to an alpha state of deep relaxation so in that theta state we a lot of um, memories can surface so being in nature can often surface the trauma but then I think it's very important to process it so I think then you would need to be with a coach or to to process what's coming up for you so that you don't constantly stay in that state and keep repeating it but you resolve it Yes, I think that repeating piece is, is so important to understand, just as you were describing at the start of this conversation, Mandy, where one disconnection, that disconnection in your marriage was revealing this was a repeat of a disconnection that had happened in the past and would have kept repeating itself if you hadn't had that experience, if you hadn't had your own knowledge that kind of re that repeating that re-traumatization can really happen and I do see it in the writing community it certainly happened for myself as well before I was able to do my own training and become more aware of it I'd love to just bring this conversation to a close with with a with a little bit more understanding around that so how might somebody notice oh okay I'm at that place where I'm reenacting or I'm repeating because I think I can certainly see this and, and, and I don't know what your impression is that we're at a place where self-awareness is really growing but it can al almost feel like very bittersweet because the more aware be we become the more we see those patterns and yet that self-awareness isn't enough to really shift them so how might somebody be aware, okay, the self-awareness has brought me to a place where perhaps the memories are coming or I'm seeing the patterns, but I'm still repeating them, I'm still reenacting them. What, how, might someone be, how might someone be aware that that's happening? I think if you're experiencing a lot of negative thoughts, I think if you're experiencing a lot of disconnects, you know, either with yourself mm. or or with other people. Um, there's again, I I'm not sure if this is appropriate to bring up, but on the um, there is a link on the positiveintelligence.com site where you can go and full complete a questionnaire and become aware of your saboteurs. So it's positiveintelligence.com backslash saboteurs. Um, but again, it's, it's okay to have the awareness, so the, that's how you'd gain the awareness. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, in psychology it's called repetition compulsion. <laughs> you know, you keep repeating the same thing, hoping to get a different result, but because you're doing the same things in the same way, you're getting the same result. It's kind of like the proverbial uh, batting, bashing your head against a brick wall. Um, the only way mm -hmm. I know of, you know, obviously, is to be in, in, in a therapy situation, is to process it mm -hmm. with somebody, you know, because the disconnect happened in relationship and you need to be in relationship to process it. And unless mm -hmm. you process it, it stays in your body, it stays in that limbic system and you keep repeating it. Um, it needs to move up into the mm -hmm. hippocampus, into the area where you, you can feel it, experience it, understand it, resolve it, rewrite it, you know, all those kinds of things res so that it doesn't keep repeating itself. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And those links, we'll, we'll put them down in the, in the notes below, the Positive Intelligence and also the app, the Integrity Media app. And I have to say, Mandy, and it, I also felt this when I was watching some of your wilderness webinars, because obviously I know that you take people into nature, literally, 
but also what you're doing, which is so beautiful. You're showing these incredible nature clips in your amazing webinars and, and giving that teaching point, as you said, that you were focusing on the people pleaser. And I have found some of them so moving. The, the webinar where you described the female lion who had adopted uh it wasn't a deer it was uh i've always forget the the other yeah, name um, strange name oryx yeah. that's it yeah so i'm going to also put a link for those beneath because i think what's so lovely about that is it's exactly what you're talking about it gives us the experience of being in nature but it also gives us the experience of being with a professional with with a therapeutic professional who's going to, to to give that psychology counterpart and i think then there's a certain point at which you can sort of take the stabilizers off and then go out into nature yourself with that extra layer of wisdom but i think your wilderness webinars are such a great starting point so i'll, I'll drop a link for those below yeah thank you and also with the positive intelligence that people want to have somebody to work through their saboteurs or have access to his operating system on, on, on the mobile app because I've been through the coaching process with that. I can help people with that if they want. But yeah, I'd love to have more people on my Wonderful. weekly wilderness webinar. I'm always inspired by other people's experiences, thoughts, feelings, ideas. Um, can be some really great discussions and we can learn from each other. Yeah, because as you say, 10 people can be looking at the same shot, you know, shot or video, but all see something completely different because Absolutely. of what they're bringing because of their own experiences. Yeah, Absolutely. I'd love to. I'd love to also, Mandy, just to give you a moment just to reflect. We've focused today talking about attachment and authenticity and ways to move through trauma and how trauma might be reenacting. But is there anything else that, that dropped in as we were talking today or, or a question that I didn't ask? So there's something left that you want to share. So just a moment to reflect if there's anything there. I think the only thing I might want to share, which you personally might find interesting in terms of your sh uh, shamanic journey is that in nature, you can also do interspecies connecting. So you can also listen, and I, it doesn't have to be in a wilderness place, it's much easier there, but it can also happen at home with your own pets. You know, you can listen into what they're saying with your heart, and it's amazing the messages mm. that you can get. Mm. Again, you have That's to read beautiful. my book. <laughs> To get more yeah so of my experience awakening the wild yeah awakening the wild within awakening the wild within and that's coming out this year perhaps perhaps i'll make a note in my diary to have you back when that's come out so i can talk to you once i've read it okay yeah that would be lovely and mandy thank you so much for today thank you for your time Thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for the opportunity to just share what I hope will be impactful in other people's lives. Mm -hmm.